welcome. We're glad you're here. We're going through the book of Genesis, and currently we are in chapter 4. Uh, the book that we are uh, studying through is called The God of Creation by Jen Wilkin, and we are uh, today in week 6. So we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 4, and just a little recap um, from the beginning. Uh, we find God in the, in the Trinity there, creating the heaven and earth when there was nothing. And he created all the planet for mankind to live on. That was his desire, was to create a planet for mankind to eventually live on so he could have an ongoing relationship with him. And so it said in chapter 1 that uh, God said, let us make man in our image. So he did, and he created everything else. And then Adam and Eve were um, in the Garden of Eden, and Satan came and tricked them, tricked her, and she fell for it and committed sin against God and disappointed the Lord by disobeying the command he had given her not to eat of the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. And she did that and also gave it to her husband. He fell into sin also. So from that time on, humanity was never the same. And we now, each, each single human being, every single cute little baby that's born, <laughs> is born with a carnal sin nature because of that fall that started way back at the beginning of time. So we find ourselves today in the initial conflict, it's called in chapter 4. So Adam and Eve uh, are intimate with each other, and Eve gets pregnant, and she's going to have a baby boy. So she, in verse 1, has a boy. And I'm going to read, uh, would you read with me from chapter 4? I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. It says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. I just uh, want to stop for a second and say one of the things I appreciated was that she did recognize that this firstborn son was from God, and she gave him that credit. And then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. So she's got two healthy boys now. And then it describes a little bit about them. And it says, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So I'm going to read into this a little bit. It sounds like they have maybe a little bit different personalities, and that's what happens in families oftentimes. You can have the same two parents, but the kids are very, very different. And so we have one that was uh, kind of a farmer kind of kid. He, his name was uh, Abel, and then, or excuse me, Cain, and then Abel was the keeper of the sheep, so he was more of a shepherd. It says, in the process of time, so in a certain amount of time or season, came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. It just doesn't say much about the offering. It just says it was an offering to the Lord. And Abel, verse 4, brought the firstlings of his flock. And it's a little bit more descriptive of the kind of sacrifice or offering that Abel brings. It says it's a firstling of the flock, and it says, and they're fat. And that's really important. I'll tell you in a minute why. And the Lord respected Abel's and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Well, let's just stop right there. So you have a firstborn in Cain and a secondborn in Abel, and Cain, as the older brother, should have been taking care of his little brother, Abel, but I think there was some jealousy in there. Gosh, and isn't that how it is oftentimes? We, th we remember that, even the story of Joseph and all of his brothers that were jealous of him, even though he was the youngest, and, you know, he had that nice coat his dad made him, and... <laughs> I guess there was some, you know, preferential treatment maybe to him. And so at least they saw it that way. And so they were jealous of him and they did some horrific things to Joseph. And this is the very first two men being born on the planet. And they had as boys some jealousy probably within their relationship also. And so Cain, uh, the tiller of the ground, was jealous of Abel because when the Lord looked upon both of their offerings, he respected Abel's offering, but not Cain's. And you can read a lot about maybe why you think this is true. And there's um, oh, all different kinds of people and scholars and their books and their reasons why they think that God did not accept Cain's offering. But, you know, that's not the point. The point is that he didn't accept it. And so there's something that God saw because he's a righteous, loving God, that something he saw in Cain's offering that was not correct. They both brought sacrifices in an appointed time. Uh, they, Cain brought what he knew, and Abel brought the first fling, firstling of the flock and the fat. Uh, we do know that um, in Hebrews 11.4 it says, By faith 
Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And I think it's interesting that in the, the author of Hebrews mentioned that Abel's sacrifice had faith involved in it. So it shows me that there might be a difference between Cain's sacrifice and Abel's sacrifice because a Cain was not mentioned in this hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. It was just Abel that was mentioned there, and it said that he had faith involved in his sacrifice. Was that the reason the Lord didn't respect Abel's offering? I don't know, but it's, it's you know, God's word is not just put in there for no reason, and I think that that's an important point, po important point <laughs> to make that it mentions that Abel had faith involved in his offering. Faith um, of the offerer of a sacrifice is essential. What is faith? Well, it also says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we know as a believer and as one who wants to serve the Lord and to please him, one that wants to give our lives in service for him, faith needs to be involved in all of that or it won't be successful. One definition of faith, which there's many, but one I read said this, it's a steadiness of mind which holds one steady to receive what God had promised in his word. And that is part of it because there's an endurance that usually goes along with faith, a waiting time, a hoping time, a believing in God's word time, a, a one that it's a, a stance you take when you put both feet on the ground and say, I'm not going anywhere until God honors his word, till I see God's promises come true, till I see a solution that God has for me. It's a steadiness of mind. In verse 6, it says he's a rewarder of Hebrews chapter 11. It says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God rewards people for taking that stance in faith and willingly giving sacrifices to him as they should and being obedient in that. Uh, King David got it. Uh, he said in Psalm 40, 6 through 8, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. And then he says burnt offering and sin offering you didn't require. And then God says, I said, behold, come. And, and it says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and in your law is within my heart. So it's mentioning, David's mentioning something about the law being in his heart, the, him understanding what God's word means and wanting to be obedient to it. And it takes faith to do that. And God is a rewarder of those that will sacrifice their life that way. Romans chapter 12, what does it say? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, which are holy and acceptable to him. You know, that it's part of all of that. And I don't know uh, what Cain's offering was all about, but did he have a, uh, in his heart, did he have a conviction of sin? Did he have a, um, w a wantingness to be in, in God's perfect will? Did he have a desire to obey him? Or did he just pick up an offering, take some of the stuff and go, hey, this is good enough and throw it out there? I don't know. I do know that if it was the right kind of offering, the Lord would have respected it and he didn't. King David said, I will not give God something that costs me nothing. Real giving occurs when I give something I like and I want to keep. <laughs> Real giving occurs when I give something I like and I want to keep. And the Lord God has given us, if you're alive today, he's given you breath. And that breathing in of air is just a gift from him. And I like life. I like living. I like breathing. I like having an ability to make choices. I like that the Lord gave me um, ability to change things, ability to work at stuff, ability to serve. I like all of that. But in all of that, am I willing to lay it all down and say, Lord, you can have it all for your namesake. I, I will take my whole life, like Romans chapter 12, and give it to you for a living sacrifice. I bow to my desires. All the desires I have to do, all different kinds of things that you've given me the ability and the desire to do. I give it all to you, saying that you come first. You know, your desires come first. Your time comes first. My time is second. My desires are second my longings are second and god yours are first am i willing to do that that's laying down my life so real giving occurs when something i like i like a life <laughs> i like having a life but i lay it all down to the lord and that's what god's calling us to do instead of keeping it all to myself and living myself for myself a living sacrifice lays it all down i want to Sometimes we want to hold on to things uh, that we really like, and that's not really giving. I mean, it's easy to write a check, you know, and put it in the offering. 
Uh, sometimes that's a lot easier. Sometimes not. But sometimes that's a lot easier than giving of your time. Just write a check for it. You know, just it's just uh, I'm sure Bill Gates, when he writes a check for $100,000, it doesn't take him much time to think about it. <laughs> now, us, it would. But money to him, a check like that to him is just it's just a small gift. Laying down your whole life for the Lord is a lot different for that. It's giving it all up for him. And so if we really love our lives and we give them over to the Lord as if that's all we have to give and we, we completely give it over to, to Jesus as Lord in our life, then that's a sacrificial giving. I remember one time uh, I bought this thing for one of my friends for Christmas and it was just something that hung on a wall. It was a decoration and I really liked it and I bought it for her though. It was supposed to be her Christmas present and when I got it home, I'm confessing to you, it's kind of evil person I am. I got it home and I started looking at it and I went, you know, that's really cute. You know, that would look really cute in my house. You know, if I just hang it right there on that wall, it fits perfect right there. <laughs> I think I'm going to keep it and I'm going to buy her something else because she won't know and she doesn't care and she likes anything I give her. She's just that kind of a neat person. So I did that. That's how selfish I was. So I hung it on the wall and I didn't think another thing about it. And I bought her a different Christmas present and she loved it and she never knew what I'd done. Well, it was about a year and a half later and I don't know why she never noticed it before, but she walked into my house and the first thing she did was look at that thing and she goes, that is so cute. And I went, what? She goes, that thing that you put on the wall. And I went, I was so convicted. I ripped it off the wall and I handed it to her. I go, it's yours. It's your last year's Christmas present. <laughs> and I wanted to keep it because I liked it. And she goes, she laughs. Her. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, I bought it for you. She go, I go, but something in me <laughs> didn't want to sacrifice it. And so I liked it. And so what I gave her was a gift, but it wasn't really giving. Real giving is when you give something that you really like. I really like my time. I'm going to give it to the Lord. I really like my life where I can do what I want to do with my time. I give it to the Lord. I really like money. <laughs> I give it to the Lord. I really like so many other things. And you give it as unto the Lord. I'm sure all of us have been tested uh, in times when God has asked us to give him something we really like. Like, I really like that, God. And you're asking me to give it away. Or to be okay with you taking it if you want to. The truth is, we must give to be happy. We must give to be happy. And if we think about it, my gosh, God gave his only son. His only son. He only had one. I have one son. And I don't, I don't know if I could give his life for anybody. I only have one. But God did, and so we should want to respond to him that way. Okay, let's look at Cain's reaction. So the Lord didn't respect Cain's offering, and Cain was angry. No, nope. it says Cain was very angry. He wasn't just angry. He was very angry, and his countenance fell. That means that you could see it on his face. When the Lord said to him, I don't accept that offering, Cain. That is not from your heart. That's not what I was asking of you. His whole face changed. And he got so mad. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not will do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. What does that mean? Okay. Let's look at the response. Cain brought an offering that wasn't acceptable to God. He didn't do what God asked him to do. And God was not pleased, but he was angry at God. Is there some misplaced blame here somewhere? <laughs> don't we do that? We walk outside of God's will. We don't do what God's asking us to do. God's not pleased. And then something happens because of that. And we know that God's not pleased. And then we're mad at God because of where we're at in our life. There's some misplaced blame there, isn't there? I know I've done that. And... I'm angry. Angry at who? I should be angry at myself for being disobedient to the Lord. So God asks him, why are you angry? Why are you sad and depressed and dejected, Cain? If you do not, if you do well, things will go well with you. And then he says, if you don't, if you don't obey and if you sin, what? Let's, there's a warning here and it comes in three parts that God gives him. He says, you will do well and you will be blessed if you'll just obey me. 
But if you do not, number one, sin lies at the door. Sin lies at the door. So here's the warning, Cain. It's not the, the um, motion of anger that God was so much uh, focused on. He said, I want you to remember these three things when you're angry. And this is very important. He said, sin lies at the door, number one. Number two, its desire is for you. <laughs> Sin's desire is to take you over. Sin's desire is for you. And number three, you have to master it. It's lying in wait for you. It's ready to pounce on you. It's out to get you. That's what sin is. It wants to take you over and you have to master it. What's that mean? You have to govern it. You have to manage it. Can you do all of that? Have you ever tried to manage sin in your life? (laughs) It's very difficult to manage sin without the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in Galatians 5, though... And some people, sometimes we want to forget these two things. But in Galatians 5, when it lists the the, um, power of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, it says kindness and long-suffering and self-control, they're all in that list. So it is within your power to respond in a Holy Spirit manner, even when you don't desire to do so. And sin lies at the door. And that means... I read this description of what that means. I love this picture. It means it crouches on all fours, like kind of like a dog, and it lays down. But you can tell it's looking at you like, I don't think you're comfortable there. And if I walk by and you don't like me, you could shoot out and pounce on me from that position of your crouching down. That's what the picture is of how sin lies at the door. And its desire is to take you down. That's what God is saying. It's important to learn how to govern the emotion of anger. God gave us our emotions, which is awesome. We can be happy. We can be sad. We can be excited. We can be joyful. There's all kinds of emotions that we have. And God wired us to feel emotions. So that's not a bad thing to feel emotions. So anger is an emotion. And it's not bad to feel the feeling or the emotion of anger. But there's a warning here. And God spoke it to Cain because he realized that Cain was very angry. (laughs) And the warning is this, anger is not a sin, but it can lead to sin. Anger is not the sin, but it can lead to a sin if you don't learn how to govern it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Another little quick story. You're, you're going to think I'm nuts after this, but <laughs> Brad and I, we were in L.A. We'd gone down to visit one of our girls that lived down there, and you know, traffic was bad, and it was bumper to bumper, and I think there was a wreck up ahead, so it was really congested and it was just really slow going and we were kind of I was kind of half asleep because you're just going like you know gosh just inching along the highway and Brad was driving and all of a sudden this man I guess we weren't we didn't know but I guess he'd been behind us and he was irritated at us because he said we were pumping our brakes too much well I don't know where he wanted us to go but you know when you're in that kind of traffic you inch up and you stop you inch up that's what was happening But he was so angry. And so he pulled up to the side of me. I was on the passenger side. And he's doing all kinds of hand gestures. You know what I mean. (laughs) And he's saying all kinds of things out of his mouth. Well, I can lip read. And I was going, I go, Brad, this guy's like, he's irate. He's going crazy. I go, what did you, what did we do? And Brad goes, I don't know. I've just been inching up on this, on the freeway, you know, like everybody else. I'm stuck. I can't go anywhere. So this man, he then comes behind us again. Hog and this horn, and then he gets on Brad's side, doing all the same thing, hand gestures, verbal cursing, doing all this stuff, you know, and Brad goes, I, I don't know, and so he looked at Brad, and he went, mm, like, you've been pumping your brakes, and Brad goes, well, I don't know where to go, so then he gets in front of us, he thought this would be cool, and he waited till we were about ready to inch forward, and he slammed his brakes on, I went, this guy's lost it, and at first, nothing in me, I just thought he was crazy, But he continued to do this on all four sides of our car, and he kept doing it and kept doing it. Finally, I thought, okay, now he's ticking me off. And so he got on Brad's side again and was just letting him have it with his verbal abuse. (laughs) And Brad was looking at him, so Brad couldn't see me. Now, I don't know where this came from, but this is what I'm talking about when sin is lurking to overtake you. All of a sudden, I don't remember thinking this thought. I don't even know where this came from. But I looked at the guy, and he could see me because I leaned forward. And I'm looking at him. Brad's looking at him, so he can't see his wife doing this. And I looked at the guy, and no kidding, I took my little hand out, and I went just like this. And I act like I shot him with my finger. And the guy looked at me, and he's like, 
she's crazy. And so he <laughs> got out of there. And Brad, I put my hand down. And Brad looked at me and he goes, well, he's gone. I went, mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't say a word. And I got so convicted. Like, how could I even act like? I don't, he maybe thought I had a gun in the car. I don't know. But that was like in me. That came out of me. And I'm like, where'd that come from? It was like deep down in there. And I thought, I can't believe that popped out. Because if you would have asked me about that, I would have never done anything like that. But that was a fast train coming. So we stopped later, about an hour later, and we pulled off and we were getting some drinks. And I looked at Brad, I go, I got to confess something to you. And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, I got to confess something to you. I, I did something in the car. He goes, what you do? I go, I shot that guy with my finger. <laughs> and we kind of laughed, but then he kind of looked at me like, are you losing it kind of thing? And so I just had to repent. And when I read about God warning about how the emotion of anger can turn into a sin, I went, my gosh, what, happened to, what happens to Cain after he let this anger fester? He says in verse 8, so Cain talks with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that they were in the field, and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. It turned to murder. That, that emotion of anger that's not bad within itself, but man, it needs to be governed. It needs to be governed because it's on its own. It's in control, and it has the speed like a machine, and it'll just be going so fast that it'll get out of control before you can control it. So just do this. Anytime you feel the emotion of anger, this is a warning to the Lord, something practical you can take out of this Genesis chapter 4 for today. This is a warning from the Lord. When you feel the emotion of anger, don't, don't condemn yourself for it. Just, I hold it like a hot potato. I go, okay, first thing I need to do when I'm feeling like that is not probably say anything. <laughs> I'm just going to keep my mouth closed. Somebody told me once, if you speak when you're angry, you'll give the greatest speech you ever regret. And I've done that before. I have spoken to family members when I'm angry, my husband when I'm angry, and I, it was a great speech, and there was some doozies in there. But I regretted almost every single word of it because it came out of anger. There's another scripture that says, you know, soft answer turns away wrath. There's all kinds of scriptures that talk about what you do when you're angry. James 1.20 says man's anger doesn't bring righteousness. It doesn't. Man's anger doesn't bring righteousness. Ephesians 4.26 through 31. In your anger do not sin. That's a command. Proverbs 29.11. Fools give full vent to their rage. I was the fool. <laughs> Shot somebody with my finger. That was rage inside of me. Ecclesiastes 7, 9, don't be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. I was a fool. I acted just as foolish as he did. I brought myself down to his level. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. There's a variety of scriptures, and that's just like four or five of them. There's many in, in the scriptures that talk about the the demolition the destruction that anger can do so God's warning Cain and he's saying it's you know what sin is crouching at its door if you leave anger alone it'll turn into full-blown sin so you need to do what here's some steps to govern anger I think are wise I just listed five of them and I want to give them to you in this next five minutes Steps to govern anger. First of all, the first thing I do is try to keep my mouth closed because I know nothing good is going to come out of there until I calm down. And then I want to go before the Lord. Okay, so number one, the first thing to do is go before the Lord, acknowledge anger, and look at it, and don't deny that you're angry. So you need to look at it inside your heart. Like David says, search me, know me at my ways, see if there's any wicked way in me. Okay, you need to... In your mind, process, why, why are you angry? What made you mad? And you need to invite the Holy Spirit down inside of your heart and say, you check me out. <laughs> Am I mad because I'm jealous? Am I mad because I'm selfish and I didn't get my way? Am I mad because, I don't know, it wasn't all about me in some fashion? Or, or did you really have, were you really, uh, do you really have grounds to be mad at somebody? Did they do something destructive to you? I don't know, but you need God to sort that out. Because it also says in scripture that our hearts are desperately wicked who can know them. So if you try to measure your own stuff in here, 
you're always going to come out on top. So you need to invite the Holy Spirit and say, you give me a correct assessment of what's going on down in my heart. Okay, acknowledge that you're angry and don't deny it. And then take it to the Lord and say, now you search me and seek, seek through my heart. Sift through there and tell me what's, what's mine to own and what's theirs. And lay it out before me so that I could acknowledge this. I'm responsible for that. Or I need to, I, I'm just being selfish. I need to confess that and go on. Or no, that was definitely wrong. Now where do I go, Lord? And walk into the avenue of forgiveness. I don't know, but God will lead you to the next step. Number two, you have to will yourself to forgive an offense. That means you're going to turn your heart. You're going to will yourself to turn your heart. And I know this, when the fences are deep and powerful and the ones that deplete you that slay you those kind of offenses i've had some of those in my life and i've had some the last couple years and there was one specific thing that happened and i knew the lord like took my face and he doesn't always do this i feel like he took my hands my his my face in his hands and he just said terry you got to forgive today because if you don't you don't want to know where you're going to go it's almost like and I felt like that was in a loving way that God told me that. It was almost like, if I let you go, Terry, you're going to go down to a road that you're not going to be able to come back from because the offense was so deep. And so I had to set my will. I had to say, Lord, I don't feel like forgiving, but I turn my heart on purpose. I keep my eyes on you. And I set my will to say, I'm going to forgive it. I'm not going down that road to bitterness. It's cancer. I'm not going there. Number three, pray. Uh, between you and God that you can forgive and let go. Now you can, you and God can do a lot of business together even without the other person apologizing. They don't ever have to apologize. You can do business with God and forgive somebody on your own. Do that. Number four, ask God to help you with angry feelings and responses. Those emotions of anger are real. You know, you can't just deny that you feel them. Ask God to, how do I get rid of these feelings this this emotion you know and not let it turn into sin but it's an emotion and it's a heavy one and it's a powerful one and I can feel it makes me hot inside makes me <laughs> irritable how do I get rid of that emotion of anger I mean I, everybody's different but sometimes I just go for a run I go for a bike ride I do a hard workout I do something to in the spirit of the Lord to allow him to release some of that emotion and number five refuse to keep thinking about that offense that's an important one. Number five, in your mind, you have to ask the Holy Spirit, you quicken me. And every time I think about that thing that causes me to want to rise up in anger all over again and stir up all those emotions of anger, you quicken me, Holy Spirit, so I recognize that I'm dwelling on that past offense, the one I already forgave, the one I turned my head from, the one I sought you about, the one you said, look over here, <laughs> the one that, Lord, you told me to let go of. I refuse to keep thinking of that offense, and you think about other things. You think about the good things, the things that God's already done for you and that you're thankful for. So those are just five quick steps or quick bullets to how to govern by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't try this on your own. It has to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. How to help govern anger so it's not that runaway train. So uh, the, we go on in scripture and there's the cursing that comes from the blood that was shed. He killed his, Cain killed his brother Abel and there was bloodshed all over the ground. In verse 11, it's closed with this. And so now you are cursed from the earth. This is what God says, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Oh, he's reaping all of this because of that sin that was crouching that took over his life. Because an uncontrolled anger was just free to go and purge him. A fugitive and a vagabond, you will be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You know, I don't even see a sorry. Maybe he did and it just wasn't recorded. But it's more about, I can't take this. It's kind of more still about him, if you'll notice. <laughs> Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground, and I shall be hidden from your face. To me, that was the worst part of the whole, the whole thing. The whole part of the judgment that came to him was God was saying, I shall be hidden from your face. You won't see me around. Oh, that breaks my heart. I'll be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And here comes God's grace. Always is about God's grace. 
The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. He put a protection over him. And the Lord set a mark on Cain. I wonder what that looked like. We don't know. But it, people knew, lest anyone finding him should kill him. And so the Lord allowed him to live. But um, he had a, a horrible reaping that came because of uncontrolled anger and sin in his life. I just want to pray and close, and I just want to pray for us that God would, first of all, make our lives a living sacrifice to him, that we would know what that means, to give it all over to him, even the best parts of our lives. And then I want to pray, secondly, that we would um, heed to this warning that God's given, that we would understand the powerful emotion of anger and how to deal with it in a godly way. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that I thank you for your word that's so practical. Lord, it just, it speaks to everyday lives. And we could take an Old Testament story. I mean, we're only in chapter four of Genesis, but we can take an Old Testament truth from almost the beginning of time and apply it to our lives today, Lord. I pray that if we're holding back from you, some of the good, the good gifts you've given us, I mean, as far as spiritual gifts or or talents, or whatever we have, goods, Lord, to give to you. If we're holding back from other people, because we want to make sure we have enough for ourselves, especially in this time of the COVID virus, that you'd make us givers, Lord, and not just give out of, you know, our what's left over after we're fat and full, but, Lord, we give the best of what we have. That we'd give the best, Lord, of what we have to somebody else that's in need. That's sacrificial giving. And I pray, Lord, if we have been battling lately just this emotion of anger, Lord, and don't know what to do with it, Lord, I pray, first of all, that you would slow the train and we would get in front of you. Just hard open, Lord, that we would invite you in to do business and, you know, not conceal a thing, but just say, you have free reign in my heart and you show me where I fail you, Lord. You show me where selfishness lies. You show me where envy and jealousy made me go there. You show me when I compare myself to other people, Lord. You show me those things, and I'll confess them to you. And you rid yourself of all of that. Help us, Lord, that we'd be able to recognize when you speak to us in that way, and that you'd cleanse our hearts, Lord, and that we would get rid of the, the um, emotion of anger that's detrimental in our life that would lead us to sin before you. Thank you, Father. I thank you most of all that you're gracious and loving and kind. You are a good, good Father, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us, and we will be here uh, next week for uh, week number seven. Thank you.